Well, good evening, everyone. We're going to start. I'm sure some people will come in a little bit later. But <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm Stephanie Treleglio, the town clerk. Please welcome Russell Blair. Russell is the education officer for the state of Connecticut for the Freedom of Information Commission. He'll give us an overview of the Freedom of Information laws, and then we'll answer any questions that we have regarding the law. So, um, thank you, welcome, welcome Russell, and thank you, Mika, for letting us do this. Oh, absolutely. Appreciate it. As we're, as we're going through it, I just would say there's some things that are kind of counterintuitive if, if you've been to other meetings and if you work corporately in terms of some of the things you do with subcommittees and, and how you get together to, uh, to, work, to do work, um, work, like just work sessions and things of that nature. So it's important to understand from Russell's perspective what the do's and don'ts are, from a, from a pers particularly from a meeting perspective. And it's just, for the most part, we can do what we need to do. We just have to make sure that we notice what we're going to do so that the public is aware of it. So with that, I will turn it over to Russell. Thank you. Sure. Um, it's great to be here this evening. Uh, thank you both for, for the introduction. Um, you know, as I say, my name is Russell Blair. I'm Director of Education and Communications at the Freedom of Information <coughs> Commission. Um, and really, you know, I think the first slide could put it, you know, put it really succinctly. Um, you know, the reason we do these trainings is we want you all, we don't want the FY to get in the way of the work that you have to do. You know, you're on boards and commissions. You're volunteering your time. You're all doing important work for, for the town. That's great. Um, you know, we don't want FOI to be something that gets in the way of that. But when you're, you know, when you're on a board commission, when you're doing the public's business, um, you know, we have some laws that govern how you need to do that work, so the public has insight into, you know, what you're doing at your meetings. Um, that the public can access the records that you all use when, you, when you're making decisions. Um, you know, I hope you leave here tonight. You don't expect to be an expert in FOI. Um, you know, it can be quite complicated. Um, I'll give my contact information, you know, at the end. Um, you can always follow up if you have questions about things that come up. But we hope you leave tonight with enough knowledge that you know what you need to do. Um, you can run your meetings effectively. If you get an FOI request, you know what you need to do um, regarding that. Um, and that, you know, most importantly, you can do your town business. That FOI is not getting in the way. You're not getting tripped up. You're not getting worried about doing things right or wrong. You're not having to worry about someone filing a complaint against you, you know, over an improper meeting. You're having to come to, um, you know, hearing in Hartford and take time out of the day to, you know, to deal with that. We want you to be able to, you know, do your work effectively, do your work in public, um, do it in accordance with what's required under FOI. So we'll, we'll talk about all that. Um, so if you have questions, because this is a small enough group, I sometimes find it's more helpful to, to try to address things as they come up. So if I mention something and you kind of have a pressing thing, you know, related to what I just said, just shoot your hand up. I can sort of see the room. So I, I think that's okay. Um, I'll also save some time, um, you know, at, at a couple times in the presentation, I'll break and just ask to make sure our name's clear if we have any questions. But, um, but don't be shy with questions. I really find that's, you know, that's the reason I'm here is to, is to answer, answer all these questions that you may have. So, um, whenever I do one of these presentations, I, I take, you know, just a, a small bit of time to talk about the history of FOI just so you kind of understand how we got to where we are. So FOI has been the law in Connecticut since 1975, so we're coming up on almost 50 years that this has been the law. Um, you know, Connecticut's FOI was really one of, you know, it was post-Watergate reform. Uh, Ellen Grasso was the governor at the time. She was a real champion of FOI, partly because she was in Congress during Watergate and she saw what was happening with government operating in secrecy. Um, you know, tapes being destroyed, secret meetings, secret records. So when she came, you know, when it came time to run for governor, she said to herself, you, you know, I want to make a government transparency law, you know, something that I'm going to campaign on, and if I get elected, I want to push to get one passed. And she really did, you know, within the first year that she was elected, um, she, she got this law passed. And what makes Connecticut's open government law uh, kind of unique among the country is that we have a commission where I work, and the only thing our commission does is investigate alleged violations of, of freedom of information. So if somebody in town feels that you guys held a meeting improperly, um, maybe the agenda wasn't posted, maybe the minutes weren't posted, uh, maybe there was an improper executive session, if they have a complaint about either a meeting or um, they make a records request and they feel that the town is not being responsive to that records request, it's taking too long, they're, they're denying the request, they're, they're doing redactions that aren't proper, um, if anyone feels that their right has been violated, uh, under the law they can file a complaint with us. We get about 600 or 700 complaints a year, um, you know, from cities and towns all across the state, state agencies. Um, kind of runs the gamut, but, um, you know, again, the reason we do these sessions is so you guys can avoid that. You don't want to have a complaint come against you um, if you can avoid it, because, again, it, it takes time. It takes time with your town attorney. You may have to come to a hearing, um, you know, and all that. But um, the only thing the commission does, you know, again, is we investigate these things. 
but everything comes to the form of us in a complaint. So be thinking tonight when we're talking about all this, you know, these are all the steps we want to take to avoid a complaint. I will say, you could do everything right, and somebody could still file a complaint, but if you've done it right, you don't have anything to worry about, because if it does come to a hearing, you know, the commission's going to look at what you did, and we're going to say, okay, you know, this was handled properly, you know, complaint dismissed. Um, so there's really two parts of the law um, that we'll cover. There's the open meetings part, and then there's the open records part. So we'll start with meetings, um, and then we'll go on to, to records in the second half. And when it comes to meetings under freedom of information, it's really about access to public meetings. Um, you know, FOI is really an access law, access to public meetings and access to public records. Um, and and we, we have a law where the definitions are really important. You know, what is a public meeting? Um, I read the definition of a public meeting every time I do this, not to bore people, but because there's really key sort of triggers that have to be there for it to be a public meeting. Not every meeting of people who work for the town or, or at a board of commission is considered to be to be a public meeting. Not every meeting where people are talking about public business is a public meeting, but there are some parameters that if you meet those, those things, then it needs to be a public meeting, which means you need to do a notice, an agenda, the public is invited, you have to take minutes, so we'll go through, we'll go through that in a minute. But um, what the law says in terms of the definition of a public meeting is, a meeting is any hearing or other proceeding of a public agency, any convening or assembly of a quorum of a multi-member public agency, and any communication by or to a quorum of a multi-member public agency, whether in person or by means of electronic equipment, to discuss or act upon a matter over which the public agency has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power. Um, so I know that's a mouthful, so there's really three things that I always kind of look for, and this is what you should be thinking about if you're on a public commission, you know, what makes it a meeting. The first is that first part there, quorum of a multi-member public agency. That's really the, the key important thing. Whenever you have a quorum of your board together, um, in most cases, if you're, you're a quorum of your board is together, if you're talking about board business, that, that's a meeting under the, under the FOI law. Um, you know, most of you probably know what a quorum is. It's okay if you don't, if you're new to a board. It, it's, you know, it's your voting majority of your board. So if you have nine members, your quorum is five. If you have um, you know, five members, your quorum is three. It's enough people where you could make a decision on behalf of the entire board. So the first part of the meeting is the quorum. The second part that's important is in person or by means of electronic equipment. So there can be such a thing as an improper meeting over email, over text message, over the phone. Um, you know, a meeting doesn't just have to be in person, it can be electronic. Uh, over Zoom, you know, we, we'll talk more about that in a, in a minute with Zoom meetings. Um, and then the third part, discussing or acting upon something that's, you know, within their control, supervision, jurisdiction, or, or something that they have, you know, advisory power over. So, a quorum, you're together in person or electronically, and you're talking about your board business. When you meet those three things, those are meetings that need to be publicly noticed. Um, Number one question I get with boards and commissions, um, especially people who are new, is email. You know, you hear that and then you're thinking, does this mean we can't email each other? You know, how are we ever going to get any work done? Or does this mean I can't talk to my fellow board member about what's going on with the board? How are we ever going to get anything done? Um, again, if it's not a quorum, then it's not considered to be a meeting under FOI. Now, there can be other concerns about sort of transparency and doing your work in public and all that, but you know, tonight we're really just looking at what the FOI law says. And according to FOI, um, you know, if it's not a quorum, it doesn't trigger the meeting provision. So if you have a nine-member board, two or three members can get together. They can talk about board business. They can talk about what's coming up at the meeting. They can make decisions because they don't have control. Those three members can't do anything on behalf of the entire board. Whatever they come up with, whatever they talk about, it's going to have to come before the full board for discussion and action at a later date. So that's really the reason the quorum is in there. You know, even with the best intentions, if you gather together with a quorum, um, you know, you may find that you leave that meeting having already decided to do something or having, you know, leaning in a particular direction and when it comes time for the public meeting, there's not going to be that back and forth discussion because it's already happened. You know, the thing we hate to hear is you come to a public meeting and the board is up there saying, well, we talked about this last week and we already decided we're going to do, you know, X, Y, Z. So you want to save those conversations for the meeting. So when it comes to email, think very similar to that. Um, you can share communications over email. You know, if you receive a letter from somebody in town, you want the board to be aware, hey, here's a letter I got from a constituent. I want you all to know that we got it. Let's add it to the agenda for correspondence for the next meeting. Um, a board member could suggest an agenda item. You know, people in town are talking about this issue. I think our board needs to bring it up at the next meeting. Can we add this to the agenda? Um, you know, you can share points that you want to discuss at the meeting. And that's really the key thing, is that everything that you share there should not be people replying all and starting to discuss or 
decide what to do based on those issues. You know, if somebody proposes an agenda item, that's okay, but don't get into a discussion about the agenda item ahead of the meeting. Um, you basically don't want to, you know, have the discussion before you get to the public meeting. But you can use, use email to share information. Just having an email with your whole board attached is not automatically an illegal meeting. It's really the content um, of those of those messages. And the same thing applies, you know, for text messages. Um, you know, uh, in-person gatherings, anything like that. Um, yeah, again, three things to be thinking of. Your quorum, you're together, and it's dealing with board business. If you meet those three factors, um, you know, it really should be done in a meeting. If you're ever on an email chain and you start to see the conversation, you know, steer towards what you think needs to be done in a meeting, um, you can always say, hey, you know, hold on, let's wait until the meeting um, to discuss this. So those are really the three factors, again, that, that make something a meeting. Um, one important thing to know about FOI and meetings, uh, you know, as I said earlier, FOI is about attending meetings. Some people, uh, somewhere along the way, I think have gotten confused a little bit about public comment. You know, do people have a right to public comment? Um, there's no right under FOI or any law to have public comment at your meetings. So if you want to have public comment, that's great. I think it's important. You know, people want to speak to their elected representatives. Uh, but how you do public comment is up to the board. You're not violating anyone's FOI rights if you require people you know, to give their name and address for public comment, limit how long people can speak at public comment. Um, you could limit public comment to items on the agenda or only people who live in town. Any restrictions on public comment um, are not in violation of FOI. Now, you can't bar people from another town from coming to your meeting. You can't require people to give their name to attend a meeting. Um, but with public comment, it's in control of the board how you want to do that. So, um, you know, now that we covered, you know, what is a meeting, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the different types of meetings, the requirements for those, and some sort of general ground rules for, for meetings. So um, a couple ground rules that apply, apply to all meetings, and this is whether it's in person or, or electronic. Um, as I said, anyone can attend a meeting. Um, anyone can photograph, record, or broadcast a, a public meeting. I always make a point to say, you know, if you're at a public meeting, I hope you don't say anything that you wouldn't want recorded, but just know, you know, somebody in the audience can be recording the meeting. Um, they don't have to give you a heads up. Um, you know, I understand you guys record a lot of your meetings already, which is great, but um, somebody who's in attendance can also make a recording and they're allowed to do that. Um, and then, you know, as the first selectman said, you know, really the important thing when it comes to meetings is, is notice of when the meeting is going to take place, the agenda of what is going to happen at the meeting, and then afterwards you do, you do the minutes. And depending on the type of meeting, there's, you know, the requirements change a little bit. Those are the three things you really need to be thinking of. It's notice, agenda, and then minutes after the fact. Um, there's some handouts up there you can grab at the end. We have what we call our meetings grid, which I think is really great. I would encourage you all to take one if you're on a board or commission, because you can refer back to it and basically it says type of meeting, and then there's a, you know, you go down and say, okay, we have to do this for this type of meeting, this for this type of meeting. Um, has all the deadlines and important things to know on there. So the three types of meetings that are allowed under FOI are regular meetings, special meetings, and emergency meetings. So for regular meetings, your notice of when your regular meetings are going to be held is your annual meeting schedule. So um, every year, we're past, we're past the point where this, this happens, but you send to your clerk, regular meeting schedule lays out uh, you know, when you're going to meet for the year. You're going to meet the first and third Wednesday of every month. You're going to meet the second Thursday of every month. You know, those, are your, those are your regular meetings. Uh, a special meeting, the name is a little misleading, you know, especially sometimes to the public or if you're new to a board. I get questions from people sometimes, can we do this at a special meeting? Um, or people see special meeting you know, on, the, on the website and they say, oh my god, something big's going on. The only thing that makes something a special meeting is just the time uh, of the meeting is changing. It's not what's on the regular meeting schedule. It could be that you know, there's a holiday and you guys meet on Monday, so you're going to move the meeting to a Tuesday. It could be that you know, snowstorm, you've got to move the meeting. You want to change the time of the meeting. You meet at 7, but you want to be at 5 one day. Um, you could add meetings, you know, maybe you only meet once a month, but, but there's issues that have come up between meetings and you want to address them, you can call a special meeting. So special meeting is just any meeting that's not on your regular meeting uh, schedule. And um, the only differences between the special meeting, again, are the scheduling of it, and then the second thing to know is that when you have a special meeting, you cannot add items to the agenda at the meeting. If you're at a regular meeting of your board, uh, by a two-thirds vote, you can add items to the agenda at the meeting. So if something comes up during public comment and the board wants to address it that evening, they could add it to the agenda, they could talk about it, they could take any action. Or uh, sometimes this happens, you know, you have a Monday meeting, maybe something blows up over the weekend, and the board says, gee, we really want to talk about this. Um, you could add it to the agenda at a regular meeting. But if it's a special meeting, 
Uh, once you file the agenda, you can't modify the agenda of the special meeting. So if you're ever preparing agendas for special meetings, just make sure anything you might want to talk about is on there. Uh, you, you, know, you don't have to talk about everything on the agenda. If you don't have time to get to something, that's okay. But in a special meeting, you couldn't add something. So put anything on there um, that you think may come up. So notice of your regular meeting is on your regular meeting schedule. So if you have a special meeting, um, you need to file a separate notice for that. And typically what you're going to do is you're going to file that. You know, your notice is going to be as part of your agenda. So your agenda for your special meeting needs to be posted 24 hours in advance of the meeting. For special meeting agendas, um, you need to make sure those go on the website as well. So all agendas always go to the town clerk's office. But if it's a special meeting, make sure you post it on the, um, on the website as well. So agendas for regular and special, those come in 24 hours ahead of time. Um, and again, with a special meeting, you can't modify the agenda um, you know, at, at, at the meeting. The third type of meeting that's allowed under the law is what's called an emergency meeting. The name you know, kind of is, is pretty, you know, gives it away. It's an emergency. Um, an emergency meeting is an unnoticed meeting. So there's no notice and there's no agenda. So um, if you have an emergency meeting, it's going to draw a certain level of suspicion. You know, why did the board need to meet for this emergency reason? Um, the types of things to be thinking about when you're talking about emergency meetings are situations where uh, you cannot wait 24 hours to hold, hold a meeting. A special meeting, you can schedule on 24 hours notice. Um, you know, so we're sitting here, it's you know, 7.30, you, know, you can call a special meeting for the next day um, you know, if, if, if you need to. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility that's granted with special meetings. If, if a meeting gets canceled you know, earlier in the week, you can reschedule it for later in the week you know, and, and it can be a special meeting. But if for some reason something comes up where you cannot wait and time is of the essence, you know, this could be uh, a weather emergency, uh, you know, maybe there's a big blizzard that's come in and some boards need to take action, move money around, um, you know, hire contractors, your board of selectmen may have to have an emergency meeting to deal with the, the fallout of that. Um, we saw this during COVID early on, you know, the public health orders from the state were really changing. Um, you know, hour to hour. So there were some towns that had to have emergency meetings because they had to make decisions, you know, right then and there about what they were going to do with their schools or what they were going to do with their libraries or all these public buildings and you know how are, how are they going to um, adapt to, to COVID. So you can have an emergency meeting. It is an ability, you know, under the law, um, but you just want to be careful about it again only in the event of an emergency. Um, what's not an emergency? Uh, you forgot to bring the agenda in. The agenda needs to be filed 24 hours in advance. You did not post it, you know, the day ahead of time. You forgot it was a holiday. Somebody was sick. Um, you know, you walk it in the morning of the meeting. Oh no, we can't have the meeting because it's not 24 hours. Let's make it an emergency meeting. That's a real thing that people have asked me, and the answer to that is, is of course, you know, you know, forgetting to file the agenda on time is not an emergency. An emergency needs to be something that's um, unexpected, unpredictable, and you need to meet immediately. Uh, if you have an emergency meeting. You can only address whatever the emergency issue is. You know, it's not a free-for-all where you can talk about whatever you want. You can only address uh, the emergency meeting, uh, sorry, the emergency matter. And then the next thing uh, that's required of all meetings is minutes. We'll talk about you know, minutes more in detail in a minute, but um, in terms of when you need to file your minutes for regular meetings, file them within seven calendar days, special meetings, uh, file them within seven business days, and then emergency meetings, uh, you need to file the minutes within 72 hours. Um, all the timelines in the law for minutes are when they, for municipalities, or when they go to the town clerk's office. So like with your agendas, um, you know, FOI is a little bit of a dated law, so there's a lot of things in here where there are still physical filing requirements. If your agenda is on your website, but not with the town clerk, that's not okay under FOI. It has to go to the town clerk. And the same thing with your minutes. Your minutes need to go to your town clerk. So um, get them posted on the web as quickly as you can. You know, you want to have them out there for, for people to, to view. Um, but the law, what the statute requires, is that they need to be filed um, with, your, with your town clerk. So we have regular meetings, special meetings, and emergency meetings. Um, the motion sheets, yep. So um, another requirement for all meetings, um, this is something that doesn't come up as frequently. Uh, but there is a part of our law that says 40, within 48 hours, so no, no later than 48 hours after a meeting, if somebody comes into town hall, they have to be able to um, find out how the votes went at the meeting. The law doesn't specify what shape that has to take. Um, you know, my advice is you could just mark up an agenda and you could send that in. Um, you know, or just anything that records the votes. So the minutes are within seven days. Um, but within 48 hours, there's an additional requirement that you have just the votes available. But again, it could be very bare bones. It doesn't need to be as detailed um, as, as your minutes. Is available to the 
mean that it's got to be with the town clerk or is it available on the website and or at, at, at an office? It's got to be with the it's got to be with either the town clerk or if you have an office, you know, separate from the town clerk. So if your board has an office, they need to be physically available somewhere. We actually had a case on this last year where somebody posted an agenda online, but it was never physically filed anywhere. Um, you know, it, I, sometimes in towns you have people who are sticklers for FOI. Um, and they try to catch people on these things, and that, in, in this town, unfortunately, they got caught on that, but it was never filed with the clerk. So make sure everything goes to the clerk's office. Um, including your motion. Include, yeah, including your motion sheet. Um, but again, that can be as simple as an agenda um, marked up or something like that. Um, and what I always say with that one is, you know, typically, if somebody comes into the clerk's office and asks how the votes went, I imagine somebody would be able to find that out pretty quickly. Um, you know, either calling somebody or emailing somebody, you know, to, but make sure that you're um, paying attention to that. Again, you know, I deal with the complaints we get. I've really very rarely seen a complaint based on that, so it is a requirement, um, but I think more people tend to look for minutes within the seven days. So, um, you know, that's the, you know, you've got to do both, but I think the minutes are where more and more people tend to look. We get the motions and the minutes and the agendas in the town clerk's office and we are the ones that put them up onto the website. So it, we would take care of it a lot. Yeah, that's great. I know in some other towns, some you know, they, town, do it, they, yeah, do they do it a little, a little different, though. but, um, you know, by statute, um, all this goes through the clerk's office. Um, and the thing, though, to remember is that if somebody files a complaint, it goes against your board of commission. So it's not, you know, it, these go through the clerk's office, but it's not the clerk's responsibility to, to take, you know, to remind you, Hey, I, haven't, I don't see your agenda, I don't see your minutes. I know that the clerks do a good job of trying to keep track of that and play traffic cop and police things, but ultimately, you know, it's the responsibility of your, your board or commission. If a complaint comes in, you know, it would be against your board or commission. You know, you would be the one that would have to potentially come to a hearing and, and talk about what happened and why the agenda didn't get filed or posted. Um, you know, the clerk processes these things, but they have to come from, um, from your board. So. Um, next thing we'll talk a little bit about is electronic and remote meetings. Um, the important thing to know, I think, with electronic meetings is that uh, there's no requirement that you have to have, uh, you know, a Zoom link or, or a Teams or, you know, hybrid. There's, it, it's an option that's available to you. So, so how you want to do the meetings is up to, up to your board of commission, and it doesn't need to be uniform to every meeting or to, to every board across the town. You know, some boards, if they want to meet remotely, they could do that. Others want to meet in person. Um, how you do it is entirely up to you. If you want to have electronic meetings, however, um, there are some additional, um, you know, additional requirements that are that are um, that are in the FOI Act. Um, you know, I think with electronic meetings, you know, we all remember during COVID, we all kind of got thrown into this, right? And and um, you know, there were some growing pains. But I think what towns have realized is, you know, there's a real benefit to electronic meetings. So um, you know, again, the commission. You know, it doesn't care how you do it, but I think hybrid, you know, is a, we're seeing more and more of that in cities and towns, and, and it's a good option, I think, because it provides for, um, you know, some remote access if people want, but then people can still come, you know, to the in-person meeting if they prefer. Um, but again, how you do it is up to you. It's really just, we say, if you want to have electronic meetings, there's a few additional requirements. So I'll go over um, a couple of those. Um, you know, if, if you're really interested, if you go on our website, we have what we call our remote meetings primer, and it goes into you know real kind of painstaking detail about all the different requirements um, you know that are in there. So I'm not going to go into super detail on all those, but if you if you take advantage of remote meetings, it may be worth um, taking a look at that. But um, a couple of big changes um, in terms of how you what you have to do if you have remote meetings. Uh, the number one thing first is that if you have a regular meeting and it's going to be a remote meeting um, or a hybrid meeting, there's going to be some Zoom link for the public. Um, that's another important thing. I get a lot of questions about this. You know, what makes it a hybrid meeting? It's how you advertise it to the public. So you can have members zoom in to an in-person meeting, and it doesn't necessarily make it a Zoom meeting for everybody. If you think about this, before we ever had Zoom, um, you would have board meetings in person where a member would be on the speaker phone or would call in to the meeting. So you can have somebody, you know, by that same logic, somebody can zoom into a meeting uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean you have to open up the Zoom to everybody. Um, if you can open up the Zoom to everybody, you know, sure, you could do that. You know, it allows for more access. But um, if there was a situation where a board member was, you know, traveling or was sick at home or something but still wanted to participate, you could always bring in a board member remotely or a presenter remotely, and it doesn't make it 
um, in electronic meeting. Electronic meetings are how you advertise it to the public. But let's say you had a meeting where it was going to be um, uh, remote or it was going to be hybrid. If it's a regular meeting, the agenda is still 24 hours in advance, but 48 hours ahead of the meeting, you have to have the link available on your website, um, the link to where people can find that meeting. If it's Zoom, you know, the Zoom link, Teams, the Teams link, the dial-in number, whatever the electronic instructions are, how they find the meeting electronically, that needs to be posted 48 hours ahead of time. The agenda still comes 24 hours, but 48 hours ahead of time you need to have um, that, that link available. And then the other big change is recording of meetings. Uh, another common question I get from people, you know, what meetings do we have to record? Um, I know some agencies, you know, towns, they record every Zoom meeting that they do just because they want to, they put them up on YouTube, they maybe have a public access channel, you know, whatever they want to do, that, that's great. But the only ones that you absolutely have to record under the law are if you have a, a regular meeting, so kind of like that other notice requirement, regular meeting, and it's online only. So a regular meeting where everyone is on Zoom, those are the meetings under the law you have to record. Any other meeting, you could record it if you wanted to, you're not required. But online only, regular meeting, you have to record that meeting, and then post it on your website within seven days. So same time frame as the minutes, um, you also post the recording. The recording never substitutes for the minutes. You always still have to do minutes of your meetings. Um, but again, online only, regular meeting, you post a recording on your website as well. And you have to leave the recording up for at least 45 days. After that period of time, you could take the recording down um, you know, if you needed to save space for, for future meetings. Um, and another thing with that, sometimes people ask is, you know, is there any certain way we have to post it? The answer is no. As long as people go on your website, there's a way where they can find the meeting. It could be a link to YouTube. Um, you know, whatever, as long as there's somewhere on there where there's a link to where they could access the video recording. Um, last thing I'll say with electronic meetings is, you know, we saw more of this early on in, in the pandemic with, uh, with Zoom bombing. You know, we saw this at public meetings sometimes where, you know, their, their planning and zoning is presenting the site plan and somebody comes in and hijacks the screen and they're playing music and videos and pornography and all this kind of stuff and the meeting kind of goes off the rails. Um, I think the technology's gotten a lot better and, and the security's better. I don't hear as much about that anymore, but I still, it still comes up from time to time. Um, but just know, you know, same thing as an in-person meeting, you have a right to run an orderly meeting. If somebody is being disruptive, they're, they're you know, taking over the meeting like that, or they're yelling or shouting or they won't mute themselves, you know, anything where they're getting in the way of meeting running, um, it, it's easier in the virtual world because you can just click a button and you can just come out. So if somebody's being disruptive online, um, you know, and they won't correct their behavior and they're, and they're not allowing you to proceed with your meeting, uh, you're not violating anyone's rights if you mute them or if you kick them out or anything like that. Uh, there's even a provision in the law that says if you need to, if, if, you know, if all hell breaks loose, you can shut down the meeting and you can reboot it at the same point um, if you need to do that to regain control. So, um, you know, you're in control of your virtual meeting. Sometimes people um, get a little bit bolder when they're behind the keyboard. You know, they can hide their face, they can put a fake name. You know, it's easier than walking into this room here and trying to do the same thing. But if somebody tries to um, act inappropriately and disrupt the meetings, um, you know, you have a right to kick them out or meet them. So the next thing we'll talk about with meeting. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Does that also hold true for a regular meeting? Yeah, the regular meeting, obviously, the same, same thing holds true. So um, the regular meeting, though, it's a little harder because you, you, know, you have to maybe physically remove the person from the room if it comes to that. Um, but, um, but yeah, same rules apply for regular meetings, you know, in person. If somebody's being disruptive, if they're being unruly, if they're not allowing you guys to, um, you know, conduct your business, the right of the public is to attend the meeting. It's not to stand in the back of the room and shout at the board or, you know, to address the board at any part of the meeting or anything like that. You know, they're not supposed to be booing or clapping or, you know, whatever it is. It's really that they're there to attend the meeting um, and, and not, to, not to, be, um, to be disruptive. Um, you know, the last thing I'll mention too um, with, with meetings, because this sometimes comes up, um, I know you guys are not like a small, small town, but sometimes, you know, you get these issues where um, you know going into a meeting that this is going to bring out a bigger crowd than normal. Um, you know, it's a hot button issue, it's been in the paper, it's on the news, whatever it is, you, you expect, okay, we're going to have a large turnout for this. Um, again, FY is an access law, so just be mindful of rooms that you're having certain meetings in. Um, you know, if you had a meeting here in this room tonight and you were expecting, you know, that you were going to have too many people and it was going to be over capacity, 
even though you know there's that number on the door that says you know the fire marshal says you only have so many people in the room, if somebody is denied access to a meeting because the room is not big enough, they can file a complaint um, over that. Uh, the example I give is I grew up in uh, a small town, Chester. We have like 3,500 people. There was a thing maybe eight or ten years ago where there was a push to change the zoning laws to um, ban people from having roosters in their yards. Um, people got very upset about this. It became like this very very big issue. Um, our planning and zoning commission had to hold a meeting in the high school, or sorry, the elementary school gym, because it was the only place big enough where they could physically fit all the people who wanted to attend that meeting. So um, just keep that in mind if you're ever dealing with something. You know, came up recently in Newtown where they had their board of education was hearing some challenges. The folks in the library drew a really big crowd. Um, they had to move the meeting, I think, to the, uh, the high school cafeteria um, to accommodate everybody. So um, just be mindful of that. Can we move the meeting the same night? without canceling the meeting and making a special meeting. If we put like a notice on the door that, you know, it's been moved across the street to the center building. Sure, so um, what the law allows you to do is you can adjourn a meeting to an alternate location. So if you were able to do that the same evening, you could do that, you know, put a notice on the door to this room and say, you know, we're moving over across the street because the, the room was too small. And make sure, you know, the notice says where the meeting's gonna be and, and all that so if somebody shows up. Um, they can move over there. But yeah, you can adjourn a meeting. Um, same thing happens too, you know, let's say it was, you know, the night of the meeting, a tree falls on this building, you could post a notice on the door and say we're moving it to the library because the building was damaged or something like that, or a power outage, um, things like that. If you want to adjourn a meeting though, you're moving the physical location, uh, you do have to post a notice at where it was going to be held with where, it, where it's been moved to. Okay, so um, next thing we'll talk about is executive session. Um, you know, most of you probably have heard this term before. If you're unfamiliar, executive session is basically, you know, we're talking all about open meetings. Executive session is a portion of your meeting that is closed to the public. Um, so when the legislature put together FOI, um, they said, you know, there's going to be some discussions that boards have where there's a public interest in having this in, in private. You know, perhaps it pertains to a lawsuit or it's a personnel matter or it's a security issue. You know, there are certain discussions um, you know, even in the interest of government transparency where we have to say, okay, there's a good reason, you know, good public policy reason why these discussions maybe are, are, are not going to be held um, out in the open. Um, the number one thing though with executive session that I, I try to impart on people is executive session by statute is very limited. When you look at executive session, uh, the statute lists the things that are permissible. It's not meant to be a place to have you know, conversations over topics that make us feel uncomfortable, or a place to have a conversation, you know, I, I don't like to hear people say, well, you know, we're concerned about the public blowback, so we want to do this in executive session. That's not what executive session is for. Executive session is for very specific, um, you know, reasons in statute that will go over in a second. I got a call from a town last month where they were presenting their annual audit of their town budget, and they said, well, the auditor doesn't really feel comfortable presenting in public. Can we do an executive session? And the answer was no. It's you know, you're presenting you know, the audit of your town. It's a public record. You know, it's the town budget. It's is public business. Um, you know, maybe find somebody who's comfortable doing that, doing that in public. But that's not an executive session reason. Yes. What number of complaints uh, your complaint log is executive session complaints? I would say in terms of meetings, um, you know, so, so if we get 600, 700 complaints a year, I would say maybe 25% are meetings based, um, but executive sessions is probably the most common um, thing we see. You know, executive sessions, um, agendas for executive sessions, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, you know, essentially because the public is not there for the executive session, um, you know, it, like it or not, it's going to draw sort of an increased level of scrutiny because they're really going to be wondering, well, gee, what are they doing in the executive session? Why do they have to have an executive session? Um, but as long as you're, you know, within one of these reasons that we go over, um, you know, you, you, you should be okay. Um, but again, I think the important thing is, you know, when you have an executive session, um, you know, make sure it's for one of the permissible reasons, and then we'll talk about the agendas for executive session in a second. But also with the agenda, you want to be, um, you know, you need to be fairly clear about what you're talking about. You know, don't try to obfuscate um, the topic of the discussion. But the five reasons you can have an executive session under the law. The first is to discuss personnel matters, and this is personnel matters um, dealing with uh, either you know, town employees or potentially it could be personnel matters involving the board if you're talking about appointing a new member um, or there's some sort of intra-board dispute or something like that. But personnel does not mean you know, staffing budgets or, or 
um, you know, organizational charts or, or things like that. It's, it's personnel dealing with, you know, again, a town employee or a board member or a position or, or something, like filling a position um, or something like that. Um, you know, specifically, I think what the statute says is something about, you know, it's a point of the appointment, evaluation, um, uh, dismissal of a, of a public officer or an employee, and that includes board members. So you're talking about a specific person in this executive session. When you have a personnel executive session, you have to notify the person who's the subject of that executive session um, and tell them that you're having this executive session. And their right under FOI is that they can ask for the board to hold that discussion in public. Um, they could say, I don't want you going into an executive session to talk about me. Whatever you're going to say, you know, do it, do it in public. If they make that request, the board has to honor that request. Yes. Do you have to put an executive session into the agenda? So you can move into executive session um, at the meeting. Um, you know, if there's something on the agenda, uh, you know, and, and you start to veer into a territory where maybe the board feels, okay, let's pump the brakes here. We want to go into executive session. You can do that at a meeting. Um, whenever you go into executive session, you need to have a two-thirds vote. In that case, because it wasn't on the agenda, you know, you want to make sure you clearly state, um, you, you know, maybe you have an item on there. I'm trying to think of where this could, could come up. Um, you know, potentially, I don't know, there's a, there's a lawsuit settlement that is set to be approved, right? Maybe it's on the agenda. You, maybe there's already been a previous executive session where questions were answered. So it's just on the agenda for a vote tonight. Um, but the board says, well, before we vote, somebody has some questions. Can we talk about an executive session? So you could, you could add an executive session at, at the meeting. Um, but again, you want to have the two-thirds vote. You want to clearly state the reason. You know, we are moving into executive session to discuss, um, you know, the, the, the Smith lawsuit. Um, you know, you discuss it, and then you can come out and you could vote on, on a settlement or something like that. Um, but that's a good question. So you can, it doesn't have to be on the agenda, but when it is on the agenda, um, we'll talk about it in a second, kind of some, some best practices for that. So um, uh, five reasons for executive session. Personnel matters. The second is pending claims for litigation. Um, you know, a lawsuit's been filed against the town, CHRO complaint's been filed, an FOI complaint's been filed, it could be a board considering taking legal action, you know, sometimes uh, your board may be, may be considering appealing a state decision or suing a state agency or something like that. Um, any kind of imminent legal action could, could fall under pending claims or litigation. Uh, third reason for executive session is if you're discussing security matters and you feel that a public discussion would kind of compromise uh, the issue that you're talking about, you know, maybe you're considering purchasing a new security system for this building. Your board of selectmen could meet in executive session to talk about you know, the parameters of that system. How many cameras are we going to put in? Where are we going to put the cameras? Uh, you know, are we going to put a panic button in the town clerk's office? You know, the types of things that you may not want someone to know the ins and outs of the system or how, or how it works or how it operates. Um, now, if you were voting to spend money on the system, you know, that would be something you need to do in public. Um, another important thing with executive session it's for discussion, it's not for action or, or taking votes. You cannot vote in executive session. So whatever you do in executive session, whatever you discuss or talk about, uh, you can arrive at kind of a conclusion, okay, we had the executive session, um, this is what we want to do, but you have to come out and you would have to have a public vote. So if it was a personnel executive session, you know, and you decide, you know, it's a disciplinary matter and you want to dismiss an employee, you know, you have an executive session and then afterwards you have a vote, okay, based on the conversation in the executive session, we're going to vote to terminate you know, whoever it is, or we're going to vote to um, accept the resignation of, you know, whoever it is. So whatever action you take, you need to do that in, in public. Um, Does the name have to be given up public in personnel matters? So the personnel matters, you know, on the agenda or at the meeting, you don't have to necessarily identify the individual employee, um, but we've had cases where we've said you've got to say a little bit more than just personnel matters, you know, not we're going into executive session to discuss personnel matters, but maybe something like, you know, we're having an executive session to discuss the performance of a town hall employee. We're having an uh, executive session to discuss a disciplinary matter involving the public works department. Um, you know, we're having an executive session to discuss the performance of a police officer. Um, you know, things like that, you know, think of, you know, categories or ways to, um, again, you don't necessarily need to identify the individual person. Um, the way to think of it, though, is that the public doesn't have a right to be in your executive session, but they have a right to know the topic that's being discussed. So, you know, by putting that on there, you know, discussion of the performance of a police officer, you know, that could be anything, right? I mean, it doesn't really reveal what it is, but it tells people, okay, they're talking about something going on, you know, in the police department. And then if there's any action that's taken, 
you know, the action is taken in public. So there's a little, you know, limited public view. You know, really executive session allows for the board to have kind of frank discussions and deliberations, um, you know, to help you arrive at a decision without, you know, the pressure of a public meeting if it's one of these, you know, sort of more sensitive topics. So personnel matter, pending claim or litigation, security. The fourth reason uh, at the municipal level is if you're discussing the sale or lease of property um, and you feel that a public discussion would impact the purchase price, um, you know, let's say, for example, that you're um, looking for um, a piece of land for new athletic fields for the town. Maybe the town, you know, can afford to spend up to $500,000. Uh, you find a piece of land listed for $200,000. Um, you know, you may want to be able to discuss your price point, what you want to offer the person. You could do that in an executive session so you don't have to kind of reveal your strategy in terms of how much you're going to you know, potentially spend. When it comes time to spend the money again, you would need to do that in public. You had a, a question over there. Um, okay. Um, so you said an executive session, we can discuss security matters, but such but we can't make decisions in an executive session. You cannot vote on any. So may, maybe making decision is not the best way to term it. Um, you know, basically you can't vote in an executive session. So if you were having a meeting, you know, a security executive session, and you know your security contractor is there, you could certainly decide sort of the parameters of your system, but. Um, you know, if, if the board needs to spend money, you know, that would be where you would have to have a public, a public vote. So you can, um, you can discuss things and, and maybe make some decisions, but anything that requires board action, you can't take those actions in, in, a, um, in an executive session. So typically, you know, what you'll see a lot of times is, you know, there'll be an executive session, and then when they vote, you don't have to talk about what was in the executive session, but you could just say, you know, based on you know, the discussions in executive session, we're going to vote to do whatever, you know, you know we're, we're going to vote to spend $30,000 on the security system as discussed in executive session, something like that would, would be fine. Um, so you can't vote during executive session. Um, oh, the last reason for executive session, number five, is, is the broadest, and that one, what that law, uh, that provision basically says is any records that are exempt from, from FOI, so we'll talk about records in the second piece, but if, you're, if, the, if your board is, is privy to any records that, that would not be disclosed under an FOI request, um, you know, maybe it's records protected by attorney-client privilege, um, you know, it could be certain personnel records that you're reviewing, it could be, um, you know, a uh, proposed settlement agreement of a lawsuit, you know, anytime the board is dealing with something that is, that is confidential, they can do that in an executive session, which makes sense, right? You, know, you don't have to publicly discuss documents that are exempt. However, if you start, you know, discussing documents during a public meeting in public session, um, you know, they're no longer necessarily protected, um, you know, by like attorney-client privilege, for example. We had a case a few years ago where somebody was at a board of selectmen meeting, started reading from a memo from their town attorney. Somebody after the meeting said, okay, well, can I have a copy of the memo that you were reading? And they said, no, that was attorney-client privilege. But if you know anything about attorney-client privilege, you know one of the important factors is you keep it private. So, um, you know, if you're up here, reading things or they're on the agenda at the meeting, um, you know, those are not covered, but if it's, a, if it's a document that you wouldn't have to release under a FOIA request, you could review that in an executive session. Um, so as I said, you can't vote during executive session. Um, who can attend an executive session is a common question that I get. It's up to the board or commission, so you can bring in whoever you want to your executive session. The important thing is the people that you're bringing in should be there participating in the executive session. You're asking them questions. Um, they're giving testimony about something that happened. Um, you know, you need their legal expertise. Um, whatever it may be, it's a personnel issue. You need the first selectman there to talk about it. Um, you can bring in whoever you want, but you want them there, you know, participating. You don't want people just sitting in the back of the room because then you're doing what we call creating a second audience. You're allowing some people to observe the executive session, um, but not members of the public. So anyone you want to bring into executive session is fine. Um, if you don't need the person any longer and the board is deliberating, you know, you could ask them to leave and wait with, the, with, with anyone else um, that was excluded. Um, executive session is part of a regular, you know, regular special or emergency meeting, so still do, a, still do a agenda, even if the only thing on the agenda is executive session. You still do minutes. The minutes don't need to reflect what happened in the executive session. Um, obviously, they, they do have to reflect who was in attendance at the executive session. So if you're doing the minutes and there's an executive session, make sure um, you record who was in attendance and also record the votes to go into executive session. You want to make sure um, you know, that those are taken properly. 
So you vote to go into executive session? Yes. But when you're in executive session, then you're going to go back to public session to perhaps vote on an issue you discussed in executive session. Do you motion to uh, go back into so public session? session? You don't really need to under FOI. I mean, I think obviously if people still want to talk, you know, you're probably not going to prematurely end the executive session. Um, the important thing, though, is that you should never adjourn from an executive session. You should still come back to public, right. even even if you guys are here until 11 o'clock on an executive session and right. there's nobody else in the building. You still come back into public. How you do it is kind of up to you. You know, you could just say. But you could just is, magically. Yeah, you could say, "Well, I'll do it." Everyone will say, "Okay, all right, yeah. we're back." You know, you don't. It doesn't necessarily need to be like a vote that you recorded with the yeas or the nays or anything like that. And then, do, and then, does the chair call the regular meeting or special meeting or emergency meeting back to order? Yeah, well, you know, just time. we're back in. Okay, we're back in public session. Okay. Uh, you know, make sure that you know if there is anybody in, out in the public or anything that they're told that they can come back in. Um, but yeah, don't adjourn from from directly from executive session. Right. The one area with executive session where we've seen people get a little tripped up recently is with virtual meetings, and part of this is just kind of like I think unfamiliar with the technology. So if you have an executive session, you want to make sure you do it in a way where. You know, you can't kick the members of the public off and then tell them, okay, well, you guys have to log back on when we're done. You have to find a way where, you know, put them in a waiting room or the members go to a different, some way where the meeting still stays active. Obviously, they don't get to listen to the virtual executive session, but you just need to make sure there's a way where they are still in the meeting um, until it actually ends. Um, you know, we had a case, I think, where, you know, something happened and they, and they kicked the person off, and then the guy couldn't get back on, and he filed a complaint because he didn't really miss anything. But you know, his complaint was that, well, I don't know, you know, for I didn't know if they were going to do anything because I wasn't able to see the end of the meeting, maybe they were going to vote, and I added no. So, um, if you have executive sessions on virtual meetings, just make sure um, that you don't lose people in that transition because I know that can happen sometimes. Um, okay, so. Um, so the last thing we'll cover with meetings is, you know, we talked all about those three triggers for a meeting, um, but then if you, you know, if you look at the definition of a meeting, the last part of it says, meeting does not include, and it includes these, you know, certain situations where you can meet those factors, but it's not considered to be a meeting under FOI. So it's kind of like a carve out, and these are not executive sessions. So these are things that you can do, and it doesn't have to be um, during a meeting at all. So. Uh, the number one, first one that, that you run into is caucuses. I get a lot of questions about caucuses. So a caucus, uh, by definition in, in the statute, is it's members of the same board and the same political party. So even if a caucus is a quorum of a board, so if you have a five-member board and you have three Democrats, two Republicans, the three Democrats are a quorum, but because they're all members of the same party, they're allowed to caucus together. So it's a pretty big loophole, um, you know, I'll admit in the meeting provision of the law. Um, but, you know, caucus needs to be limited to just board members. Um, and again, board members of the same party. So a caucus is not like an executive session where you can start bringing in all kinds of people. Um, the challenge is there's no limitation under the law about what you can talk about in a caucus. So, um, you know, I, I, I was a reporter before I did this. Um, City of Hartford, their council, is guilty of this. They would, the Democrats on the council control the council. They caucus before the meeting. That's where they have a lot of their discussions and their decisions. So if you watch a Hartford City Council meeting, a lot of times there's not a lot of public discussion. Um, they're allowed to do it under FOI. Um, you know, my advice would be don't. You know, try not to do that. Try not to see caucus as a way to, um, you know, avoid having public discussions. Um, you know, again, the law doesn't limit what you can talk about, so there's no repercussion other than. You know the transparency that I think is really important. You know there there are things in a caucus that make a lot of sense. You know if you're trying to get on the same page with your party members, maybe you want to talk about you know before the meeting who's going to present what. You know you want to have a unified position. You want to have sort of everyone being on the same page or something like that. Um, talk about how people are going to vote. Um, you know those types of things. You know are not as much of a concern. I think we're more concerned when we see people you know deliberating and discussing the things before the board in a caucus, but. Um, you're allowed to do it because there's that, that provision in there. But again, caucus, unlike executive session, it's same board, same party, and that's it. You know, don't be bringing in your town chairman unless they happen to be on you know, that, that same board. 
Um, other examples when you can have you know boards together, forums together, and it's not a meeting. First, uh, second one is uh, personnel search committees. So any board can create a personnel search committee to um, recruit an executive level employee. We see this a lot of times at boards of education. You know, the school board can make a search committee, and then that search committee, their meetings don't fall under FOI, so they can meet whenever they want. They don't have to notice the meetings. They can meet with their search consultant. They can review resumes. They can interview candidates. They can do whatever they want. The search committee could be the whole board of that if they wanted to do it. Um, search committees are, are exempt um, because when they make a recommendation, it's going to have to come back for a public discussion and vote at some point. So once they have a selection of their candidate, there's going to be some public, um, you know, participation in, in that process. I'm sorry. But I yeah. yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. You go first. <coughs> and just a question about the caucus. If the caucus, <coughs> I'm sorry, I should like first. If the caucus then directs a question or a feeling to someone not in the same party, is that a violation or a potential legal? Do you mean like in, like in the if, if there's a caucus and then one of the <coughs> members contacts? A member right. So going off of your statement before that the caucus isn't illegal, it's just not transparent. So if I caucus with two other members of my party and then somebody approaches another member of the board and says, hey, this is what we're feeling for this, is that a violation? So, um, you, you know, probably not on the face of it, but you want to be careful to avoid um, what we call a, a serial meeting, which is where, you know, you basically break your board up into like smaller, <coughs> essentially where you try to feel out where everybody is on, a, right. on, on something by splitting it up into different groups. So, so those things you want to be a little bit careful. But, you know, if, if the Republicans caucus and then one of the Republicans wanted to go, you know, tell the Democrat, well, this is what we think of it. If it was just those two members talking, it probably would be okay. Okay. Uh, but you want to be careful about, you know, if it's, you know, all on the same topic within a very short period of time, it looks like something where you're trying to, Kind of get around the meeting provision. It might be something that would be a little bit more suspect. Okay. Yes. So what you were just saying about you know, for example, like a board of education having a search committee because the actual hire has to go in front of the larger board as a whole. Is that true then of any subcommittee of a board? So um, it, it's not true for any subcommittee of a board. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that because I I do sometimes I get questions on that. So when you have a subcommittee, um, and this kind of goes to your point earlier about you know board members working outside of meetings and how to handle that. If it's a formally designated subcommittee, then it is a, it's an entity under FOI that needs to file agendas, minutes, you know, have public meetings and all that. If it's a, you know if it's an official subcommittee of the board, what makes that an what makes um, an official? Subcommittee? So I would say if it's something where you know if the board votes and designates members or appoints them to a specific committee and it's named and, and there's kind of like a paper trail, okay, we're creating a school building committee, we're putting these members on it, okay. um, you know, those are the meetings, those subcommittees need to follow FOI. However, what I say is you can have board members do homework. So if you have, you know, a nine member board, you could take three members and say, okay, you know, at the next meeting we want to talk about, you know, I don't know, locations in town where we think we could build a dog park. And these three members, I want you to go out and talk to residents and get some ideas about where we could have it and then come back to the meeting and report out on it. Now that's not really a formal subcommittee because it's not like you created it and voted on it and said this is a dog park committee. That's just three members that are doing some legwork. So you can have those situations where you can do legwork and come back and it's not really a committee, so those aren't considered to be meetings. But you know, let's say this thing got far enough along where they said, well, we're going to appoint a dog park committee. Then once it's appointed and it's more That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. If, but the, that was a really great way to frame it. If you have a couple members of the board that are working on homework that then the board will take on together. Yeah, the, the way to be thinking about it again is that, you know, you can discuss things outside of board meetings in, in, in limited circumstances, especially if it's less than a quorum, because ultimately you're going to have to get buy-in from your other members. Whatever they come up with, they're going to have to bring it back to the board for discussion and, and, a, and a potential vote or something like that. So you can do homework outside of meetings, um, you know, uh, but again, not a quorum. That's kind of the, the thing there. Okay. Um, so we talked about caucuses. There were a couple of yeah, just oh, one other about the caucus again. Sure. Do, you, do you actually like leave the meeting, like the people that are caucusing, and then come back? Well, I think a lot about of people, caucusing before so the caucuses are, don't need to be held during a meeting. So most people, I think, would caucus before the meeting. So you know, if you, but but a caucus can be held anywhere, anytime. There's but no, what do you do? Actually, leave the meeting, like to 
two or three people that are caucusing? Well, I would think that, again, I think typically if it happens at the local level, it would be, it would be before the meeting. Okay, um, so. You know, I guess if there was, you know, if, if there was something where the one party wanted to, you, I guess you could, you know, you know, um, what was I going to say, um, you know, take a break in the meeting and, and, and then stand and go caucus, but usually it would be something like before the meeting or, you know, outside of the meeting would, would be a caucus. I, one more about notice of meetings. So you mentioned before that it would have to be posted on the website. Um, is it, it so? Could it could a town's bylaws or a board's bylaws alter that, or would it, a, an agenda has to be posted 24 hours business or 24 hour regular? So, so could you post it's on a Saturday for a Monday meeting, or would you have so to post Friday? Friday, yeah, meeting? Friday. It's got to be 24 hours. So the way to think of it is 24 hours of kind of public. You know, it needs to be filed when there's public access to the meeting. So if you have a, a Monday meeting, you know, you got to get it in by the close of business Friday. You can't come in on the weekend. And, and if you send it to clerks and everything is fine, but if it's not posted on that website and the meeting is held, it's technically... So the, the only agendas that have to be absolutely posted are special meeting agendas. Okay. If for some reason a, reg, you know, a regular meeting agenda doesn't make it up on the website until the morning of the meeting, as long as it was in the clerk's office, you know, on that Friday, if it got up Monday morning, um, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a violation. If it was a special meeting, though, those need to be posted online 24 hours in advance. I have a question. If someone's an independent, can they caucus with whichever group they want? So, um, that's a good question. Um, if, you know, if you're independent or unaffiliated, you can, cho you can choose, but you can't go back and forth. So you have to kind of decide, you know, what the law says is that, you know, you're supposed to, if you're, if you're unaffiliated, um, pick a caucus and then file something with the clerk's office. Um, I don't know how often people actually ask for those, but it says there that if you're not of the same board, or out of the same party rather, you know, maybe you have an unaffiliated who caucuses with the Democrats, um, you're supposed to put something in that just says, I'm gonna caucus with the Democrats for my term on the you know, board of selectmen. It, not to be pedantic, but independent is actually a party. Yeah, unaffiliated, yes. Yeah. So it's unaffiliated. I, I guess you I think you meant unaffiliated. Yeah, unless you were elected as an independent, yes. Well, I think you, yeah, this person is elected as an independent. Yeah, but either way, you can you can caucus with either side, but you can't go back and forth. So you just have to decide who you want to, you know, who you're, and you probably know, right? You know, sometimes you could be, you're unaffiliated, but maybe you're endorsed by the Democrats or something like that. So you can caucus with whichever side, but you, but you pick a side and then stay with them. And file that with the town yeah, clerk, right? So for my four-year term on the, you know, housing committee, I will caucus with whatever. Yeah, something, something like that. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, so one important thing to know about caucuses um, is, you know, the caucus exemption allows you to meet. It doesn't say anything about the records. So if you create records as part of a caucus, um, those could be FOI, so just be careful because you could have a digital caucus. You could have a, a, you know an email caucus. All the Republicans on the board could email each other, and it's not an illegal, illegal meeting. But those emails are public records. So if your idea is well, we're going to hide everything by emailing ahead of the meeting, somebody could request the emails and, and find out what you were talking about. Um, so the last thing to know about um, you know that it's not a meeting under the law is what is called a chance or social meeting, and this is when. You know, your board is together, but it's not in a setting where you're talking about um, board business. You know, you're at a town event, you're out to dinner, you're at the bar, you're together in more of those, you know, kind of social settings. Um, the important thing there is, you know, again, not to be talking about um, board business. You know, I would be foolish to sit up here and think that, you know, you're never going to mention something that the board is working on, but really the thing to be thinking of is, you know, if you're at your holiday party, you know, that's not when you're making decisions about your budget or things like that. You know, try to find something else that you guys can talk about. Um, you know, as part of that, you want to try to avoid what I call the parking lot meeting, which, um, it, it, you know, everybody's guilty of this. You have your meeting at night, um, you know, it goes on and on and on. You're standing on the parking lot afterwards, you want to blow off some steam with your fellow board members, you know, can you believe what he said during public comment? I can't believe how long we were there, what, you know, what this person was wearing, you know, whatever it is, right? I mean, you know, we spend a lot of time at these meetings. Um, you want to kind of debrief with the people that you serve with. Um, you can do that a little to some extent, but you want to be mindful of that you're not, you know, continuing discussions that you had at the meeting, talking about things that are going to come up at future meetings. Um, imagine, for, you know, if you will for a minute, that, you know, you're on a planning and zoning commission, there's a contentious site plan, it gets continued to a next, you know, the next month's meeting, um, the developer's walking out of the meeting, he sees the planning and zoning <coughs> commission standing in the parking lot talking. He doesn't necessarily even need to know what they're talking about, 
you know, he could file a complaint and say, well, look, they were together talking. For all I know, they were talking about my site plan and how they were going to vote it down at the next meeting. And, you know, you don't want to have to come to a commission meeting in Hartford to say, no, we were talking about where to get pizza or something like that. So, um, so just be careful. You know, that's kind of an optics thing. Um, you know, again, you can talk about things unrelated to your, to your meetings. You know, maybe your kids are on the same soccer team or something like that. Um, but, you know, when you're together in those settings, you just want to be careful of, of the optics of that. Can caucuses overlap commissions? Uh, no, so caucuses should be the same. Have, have to be yeah, same, 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 yeah, same commission. So, um, you know, you, you, you can't really have a, the thing with that, though, is depending on the makeup of your boards, you know, you could have, you know, if two Republicans of one board and two Republicans of another board are not a quorum of either board, then they can meet together. It's not a caucus, but it's also not a meeting. But, um, you know, certainly not, um, you know, if it, not, not if it, you know, is a, a quorum two boards couldn't, couldn't meet together just because they're the same party. So two Republicans and one Republican and one Democrat, is that then? It, 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 could, it could be, well that would be a caucus <laughs> for different, different parties, but um, you know, you can meet with members of other boards if, if it's not a quorum of each board. So if, 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 you know, one member of the Board of Finance wants to meet with one member of the Board of Selectmen, um, you know, it's not an illegal meeting under, under FOI, but if it was a quorum of both, both boards, then you know, that would need to be done at a public meeting. Is that irrespective of what you're discussing? Well, if you're discussing town, you know, business before the board. So, um, you know, if they were talking about the budget, for example, you know, that would be something that you would, you know, and, and it was a quorum, that would be something to be. And just to make it very specific, if, if I was, if I'm the board of selectmen and I want to talk to one of the other members of the board of selectmen from the other party, I can do so even if it's something with regard to what we're talking about, like it's regarding voting on commission members or something like Are you that. a three member board here? We're a six member Six board. members. So you can you can talk about it. Yeah. So you and another member can talk. Um, where it gets hard. Because there's no quorum. Because there's no quorum. And where it, where it gets members. hard, and I really feel for the really small towns, is when you have a three member board of select. Yeah, because two people's quorum. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and those, so, in those towns, I mean, yeah. it, you know, <laughs> People are discussing things outside of meetings. I, I know it happens. So whenever I'm in the really small towns, I say, you know, just try not to really make decisions. It's really, you know, we had a, I was in a really small town in Eastern Connecticut uh, a couple months ago. And the first selectman looked at me and said, you're telling me I can't go out and look at a pothole with the second selectman? And I said, sure, you can go look at the pothole, but just don't talk about how much money you're going to spend to fix it or something. Right, because three of them. Yeah, so um, that, three member boards, it's hard. And, but, and not to belabor it, but I just want to make sure, if because in some situations we have um, tri-commission meetings. So prior to the meeting, it doesn't matter whether all three of those commissions are meeting, those three different commissions still can't overlap in terms of caucus. Yeah, if it was a, yeah, you, caucus is limited. Okay. Um, but if you... Uh, no, but as long as it's as not as a quorum of those three right, commissions. But if you had like three R controlled commissions, right. you could not have the R majority of every commission come together and say, well, we're right. all Republicans, so. Um, but if you picked a couple members of each, you know, you could, you, you could do that. Like if you wanted to, if the Republicans on the, you know, if two Republicans on the Board of Finance wanted to meet with two Republicans on the Board of Select and talk about budget strategy, right. they could do that. Thank you. So I have a question. If you're uh, involved in a commission and you talk to one person about, should we put this on the agenda? And they say, well, I don't know, maybe you should talk to this other person. And I talk to the other person and say, yeah, yeah. I think you should, but I'm not sure if that's the right timing to do that. So can you, t so I can talk to three people sequentially about something like that? You can, but you just want to. That's the that's where earlier I was talking about what we call a serial meeting. Right, that's what I'm you just want to be. You want to be careful with that. You know, again, with everything with FOI, you have to remember the things that come to us are, are when somebody files a complaint. So in that instance, um, you know, it would almost need to be like your fellow board members that would need to file, file uh -huh. a complaint. So um, I have another question. What are the if you sure. do something terrible. Um, we lock you up and throw you in. <laughs> 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 so, so this is, um, you know, this may be your favorite part of the presentation. So, um, you know, I will, I will admit that the, the consequences are not, um, you know, they're not typically very, very harsh. Um, we can issue fines. We don't do that too often. We can issue mandatory training sessions like this. We do that sometimes. The thing for boards and commissions, though, you want to be mindful of is that we do have the ability to nullify votes taken at an improper meeting. So if we feel that, you know, agenda wasn't proper, public wasn't invited to attend, there was an improper executive session, for the remedy for meetings can be, again, nullifying votes. Um, in some instances, 
you know, if there was a meeting that was held improperly, we can order the, the board to create minutes of the meeting. Um, you know, again, training session. So it's not, you know, a big punitive thing. Um, but again, with the nullification, you know, nobody wants to have to have go back and, and six months later trying to retake votes on something that, you know, that happened. So, you know, my advice is if you notice something ahead of time, you know, there's an issue with a meeting agenda, it doesn't come in on time, a special meeting agenda didn't get posted online. Really, it, it, the, it's best for you to just take a pause and, 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 you know, reschedule the meeting. I know it's a pain sometimes to get everyone together again. Um, but it's a bigger pain if somebody files a complaint and you're coming to Hartford for a hearing and you've got to have the town attorney coming and your, your chairman of your board is there. And it just is going to be all kinds of headaches. So, um, you know, you can call a special meeting on 24 hour notice. You can meet electronically. I think there's a lot of flexibility where if something, you know, gets messed up and it happens, you know, we're all, we're all human. Um, but if you make a mistake and you notice it ahead of time, the best thing to do is, is just to say, okay, we can't have the meeting. Something happened. We're going to have to move it to a different date. If you realize after the fact, you can always retake those votes as a as a you know pre, pre, um, like preemptive thing to say, look, it's come to our attention in the last month's meeting. The agenda wasn't posted online, so you know we took two votes. We're going to do them again tonight just to make sure we do it properly. So you can always you know, and if you did that ahead of time, chances are even if there was a complaint filed, the commission's not going to nullify it because we're going to say, well, you guys already kind of fixed it yourself. So um, you know, that's kind of where the important importance comes in is, is, is particularly with the nullification and you want to avoid um, the headaches of having to, to, to deal with that. Um, yes? I have a question. When things come before you um, and along those lines, is intent taken into consideration when you're reviewing a complaint? Like let's say you, know, you had a serial meeting you didn't mean to because you thought you were just asking about agenda items or such, but you know, a complaint gets filed, it does intent matter that, you know, either you didn't need to have sure. something for the public or you were just attempting to yeah. you know, so, get business done that then you didn't realize that you fell out of the line. Yeah, of the I think a lot of, you know, a lot of our, our complaints really, when it comes, if they go to hearings, a lot of times it is just sort of a lack of education, um, lack of knowledge. Um, you know, I think those are the cases where we're kind of least punitive. So if there's an understanding, a lot of times if somebody comes to the hearing, there's an understanding, they know they did something wrong, they say they're going to do it better in the future, um, we may find a violation, but the order would just be something to the effect of, you know, henceforth, you know, the town will follow the rules for meetings, they understand, and, and they're all set. So we're not going to order trainings and things like that or fines, um, you know, if it was an honest mistake. If it's willful or, or you know, intentional or malicious, you know, those are the ones where, you know, there could be some strong reaction taken. So, the last thing we'll talk about um, with meetings is minutes. Um, again, the important thing with minutes is you've got to get them filed on time. Um, your minutes don't need to be super long uh, or, or really super detailed. Um, under the law, the only requirements for minutes are that you record any votes that were taken, um, that uh, you have who is in attendance at the executive session, um, and just who is in attendance at, at the meeting. So, um, you know, the minutes, the detail of the minutes is really up to the person taking the minutes. Um, I say that to make a point that you don't have to include every single thing that everyone said in public comment. You don't have to include every back and forth exchange between every single board member. You don't have to, you know, listen to the tape and transcribe everything that was said. Uh, minutes are not meant to be, you know, a transcription of the whole meeting or to replace attendance at the meeting. Um, so I would, you know, encourage you, you know, not, not to, you know, bang your head against the wall trying to have perfect minutes. You, know, you want to capture the spirit of the discussion, but you can summarize things. Um, if you have a meeting video link, you could always put a link to the, the meeting on your on your minutes so people can find the full meeting if they wanted to. Um, but the, you know, our our requirement is that you get the minutes in on time. You know, if you spend, if you send us or if you send in you know 15 page minutes but they're a month late, you know, it's a violation. So um, make sure you get the minutes in on time. Sometimes your board may not meet within that seven day window. I mean, most times you're probably not going to. So the minutes that you file may not be voted on by the board. That's okay. You know, you can call them unapproved. You can call them draft, uh, subject to approval, you know, whatever you want to say. But you need to make sure you file minutes within seven days. Um, so before we move on and, and do some brief, uh, you know, talk about the records piece of FOI, anyone have any other meetings, questions? Executive session, anything? Okay. Um, so, you know, when I do these trainings for the cities and, you know, cities and towns, as expected, there's usually a lot more questions about the meetings, but um, I'll go over a few things I think it's important for you all to know in terms of, of public records and FOI requests. 
Um, you know, kind of like when we started out with, with meetings, I'll read the definition of a public record. And the one thing that I think is important to know is that um, what makes something a public record is the content of the record. It's not the device it exists on. So if you're on a board or commission, um, you can use your own devices for that work. That's okay. You can use your personal email, your personal cell phone. Um, but any records that you create that are part of what your board is doing are public records. So that means somebody could request those. Now, it doesn't mean that you or I or you know, you know, the commission or somebody's going to look through your phone, um, but it means that you may have to look through it yourself and find those records. So if somebody wants you know, all the text between the first selectman and the planning and zoning chair about a particular project, those two people, you know, if they don't have town phones, are going to go into their personal cell phone and they're going to pull out you know, any, any messages that would be responsive um, and, and provide those. So what the law says is public records are any recorded data or information relating to the conduct of the public's business prepared, owned, used, received, or retained by a public agency, or to which a public agency is entitled to receive a copy by law or contract. Whether such data or information be handwritten, typed, tape recorded, videotaped, printed, photostatted, photographed, or recorded by any other method, and except as otherwise provided by any federal law or state statute, all records maintained or kept on file by any public agency, whether or not such records are required by any law or by any rule or regulation shall be public records. So, um, you know, quick, easiest way to think of it, again, is it, you know, if it deals with Woodbridge business, if it deals with your board or commission, um, it, it's a public record. And, you know, the second part of that definition, except as otherwise provided by any federal law or state statute, what that means is, unless there's either an exemption within our law, um, and those little handouts, the booklets, have some of the exemptions, we'll talk about a few of them in a minute, but unless there's an exemption within FOI, or in sometimes there could be another state or federal law, you know, there could be a law dealing with, um, you know, for example, um, Department of Motor Vehicle. There's a law that talks about access to information at the, at the DMV. I cannot go to the DMV and FOI a copy of your driver's license. Um, it's a public record, but there's a law that says that that information can only be given out to, to very limited, um, you know, people for certain uses. You know, they can give it to law enforcement for law enforcement uses. They can give it to the federal government for, you know, different, different things. Um, but the presumption under FOI is that the public has, has the right to access public records. Um, and unless there's a particular exemption, then those records need to be provided. So we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, sort of FOI requests, if you get one, what to do, and then some of the stuff that's covered and some of the stuff that's not. Uh, if you receive an FOI request, and important to know, an FOI request in Connecticut doesn't need to be on a special form. People don't need to cite the statute. They don't need to use any special language. If you get a request for records, um, that's an FOI request. If someone sends you an email, I want a copy of this report, I want a copy of you know, your emails between you and this other person, those are all, those are all FOI requests um, under the law. When you get an FOI request, um, you have to acknowledge the request within four business days. So that's very important. You want to make sure that, you know, if you're on a board or commission and you receive an FOI request, somebody needs to acknowledge that request. It could be your chairman's going to respond, it could be the town is going to respond, but somebody needs to respond to the request within four business days. Um, and then after that point, you know, number one question I get, how long do we have to comply with an FOI request? How long can we take to give the person the records? There's not a specific timeline in the law. What the law says is you need to provide access to public records promptly. Um, helpfully, though, the commission has an advisory opinion that, that looks at how we determine if somebody's being prompt. So these are the types of factors that we consider when we're looking at how long it takes to respond to an FOI request. Um, how large is the request, right? It's pretty simple. Bigger requests are going to take longer. Um, how much staff time is going to take to compile a request? Is it really complicated? Does it require a review by an attorney? Does it require the first selectman to review it? You know, what are sort of how many man hours is it going to take to comply with this request? Um, other other uh, uh, things that are going on at, at, at the time, you know, other work that you have to complete. We understand FOI is not the only thing that you're doing. It's a small part of, of, of your job. Um, you know, even on a board or commission, you have a lot of work that you're that you're doing in these roles, and FOI is going to be a small part of that. However, what the courts have said is that FOI is a primary duty of public agencies. So you, know, you can't take your FOI request and push it to the side of your desk and ignore it for, for a year. Um, but you can balance FOI with other, with other responsibilities that you have. And if you came to a commission meeting and you said, look, that FOI request took me a little bit longer because this was right in the middle of us doing the town budget. It's the busiest time of year for our board. You know, we had six meetings in a month that I had to prepare for. You know, those are all valid things that we would, that we would take into account. So, um, you know, really when you're responding to FOI requests, it, it's really about, about balance. 
Um, but if you get an FOI request and it's a simple one, uh, you know, my best advice is just try to get it done quickly. It gets, you know, get it off your plate. If it's one or two things that somebody wants, it's not complicated. It's not, you know, something that you need to have, have people review, um, you know, acknowledge the request and then respond, um, you know, promptly. Um, if, if somebody makes a really large FOI request, you can always ask them to narrow the request. Um, you know, I would view, sometimes you get an FOI request and we view it in an adversarial nature. We start to think about, you know, who is this person? Why do they want these records? What are they going to do? The law doesn't really address why somebody wants records. They don't have to tell you why they want the records. You can ask them and they can tell you if they want to and maybe it'll help you to understand where they're coming from, uh, but they, they, they don't have to. So when you start to go down the road of starting to think about the motives of the person and what they're going to do with the information, um, I, I just find that those interactions tend to not, you know, lead to, to, to happy people on, on, on either side. So, um, you know, I, I say that to say that, you know, you have a conversation with the, with the requester. Because sometimes what happens is people make these big requests and you have a conversation with them and you realize, oh, what they're trying to figure out could very easily be answered, you know, with, with five or six pages from 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 these you know from these records, as opposed to a thousand emails that they want or something like that. A lot of times, what I've found, and I was guilty of this sometimes as a reporter, is people know, okay, well, somewhere in there is going to be what I'm looking for. So if I ask for everything, I'll sift through it, and eventually I'll find what I'm looking for. Um, maybe somebody's interested in the school building project; they want to know who the subcontractors are, so they ask for every single bill for the project, and it's you know this many pages of bills. But you talk to them and they say, well, you know, I own a roofing company and I want to know about who got the roof work for the project. And you say, oh, okay, like I have that right here. I could give you this one page, list everyone that we had that we hired to do the roof on the new school. Um, you know, so when you have those conversations, um, it may help you to narrow the scope of what you have to look for to fulfill the request. And also it may help you to get some buy-in from the requester. Number one thing I see with complaints is um, a lack of response from, from the agency. So somebody sends in an FOI request, you acknowledge it, and then you know the trail kind of goes cold. The person's following up, and they're not hearing from you. And maybe you don't have a lot to tell them. You know, maybe you're really busy, and, and you're just kind of like, well, I, I, you know, I can't tell them anything because I haven't done anything on it. Um, but the more you can try to have a back and forth conversation, explain to the requester, you know, why there's particular delays or what you're doing in response to your request. Um, I, I find the more discussion that there is between the two sides, the less likely you're going to end up with a complaint. The less likely you're going to end up at a hearing because they understand that you're working on it. And, and you know, again, I say most people because there are people who, you know, they want their records immediately. They don't understand why you can't stay up all night, you know, reviewing, you know, records and redacting them or something like that. But I think people, if you explain to them what you're doing, um, they, they tend to appreciate the insight and they're more willing to be patient versus if you never respond to them at all, um, you know, they, they just are going to get sick and tired and eventually file a complaint. Um, so uh, a couple other important things to know is, you know, FOI is really just providing copies of records that you have as you keep them, as you maintain them. It's not about doing research. It's not about creating lists for people. If somebody asks you for a list and you don't have a list, you don't have to create it. Um, you know, if, if the information is in 10 different records, you could give them all 10 records and say, you know, fi find the information yourself. You know, you have to, you know, they're, they're required to do their homework. You're giving them access to public records, but they have to, you know, whatever they want to do with them, the compiling or the, the analysis, um, you know, that's their own business. And an FOI request also needs to be specific enough that you know where to look for the records. You know, you, it, FOI requests should not be so vague that you're having to do research to try to find out, you know, what records are responsive to the request. It needs to be identified in such a way that you can um, search for the records and, and provide them. A um, couple things on fees. There's no fees for electronic records under FOI, so if somebody wants emails or you know, a PDF or anything that you can send digitally to them, there's no charge. If they want paper records, uh, you can charge 50 cents a page for paper records. If somebody wants digital records and you need to buy a USB drive or something like that, you can charge for the cost of, of the device, um, but, but not any more than that. So if you spend $5 on the USB, you could pass on um, the $5 that, that you paid for that. Um, so um, we talked about promptness. Um, you know, again, really, um, you know, with, with FOI requests, um, you know, it, it, it can be tricky, but you want to try to find that appropriate balance. It could be spend a little bit of time each week if you have a really big request. Again, you could ask the person to try to narrow their request. Um, you know, you don't want to let these things just sort of sit there and collect dust because, again, I think those are the things that are more likely where somebody's going to file a complaint if they go a really long time without hearing, um, you know, from, from an agency. 
So um, we just have a couple minutes left, so I'm just going to kind of quickly zip through some of the, um, you know, some of the exemptions um, to, to FOI. Um, you know, there's a lot of them. When the law was passed, there were six in there. Now it's grown to about 27 exemptions. And again, if there's another federal law or state statute that says something is confidential, shall not be disclosed, or it has different fee structures. You know, sometimes we just talked about 50 cents a page, but if any of you have gone to the town clerk's office and you, know, you want a birth certificate or a marriage license, you know, there's different fees sometimes for different records. Um, but if there's any record counter to FOI, that will always prevail um, over FOI. Um, you had made the point earlier about the boards and commissions and town policies and things like that. You could have town policies that are, that are you know, stricter than FOI maybe, um, or, or different in some ways. But they can't, those town policies cannot be in violation of, you know, a Freedom of Information Act. So if the town wanted to say, look, we're only going to charge 25 cents a page for paper, you know, you, you could do that. Or if the town said, you know, we want all agendas for all meetings to be posted on the website, you could, you could have that as a requirement of the town. But you can't have something that is, you know, counter to, um, to FOI. So um, some of the more common exemptions that we see, there's an exemption for preliminary drafts or notes. And typically at the board level where this comes up is, you know, your board commissions a report, you ask town staff to put something together for you. While they're still working on it, you know, they're changing the numbers, they're making edits, they're making tweaks. Um, it's not been presented to the board yet. Uh, if you got a request for that, you could say it's a draft. It's not, you know, not ready to be released at this time. Once it goes to your board for consideration, or it goes to the first selectment for some kind of action, once somebody's going to start making decisions based on those documents, um, they would need to be, need to be released. There's a limited exemption for personnel files. So these are personnel files of your town employees. The records that don't need to be released are those that would be um, an invasion of personal privacy if they were to be released. The invasion of personal privacy standard for public employees is pretty high. Um, so it's not just, you know, kind of like an executive session. It's not just information that's embarrassing. Um, it needs to be something, again, that would be an invasion of personal privacy. And what the courts have said is that standard means information that would be highly offensive if it were to be released and information that does not pertain to a matter of public concern. So typically, these are things like health records, um, you know, insurance information, um, records reflecting you know, things going on in somebody's home or with somebody's family, um, anything to do with your conduct you know, as an employee, even if it's negative, you know, maybe you got a bad performance review, um, you got caught looking at Facebook you know, at your desk and you got written up for it. You know, these things that maybe we don't want released, um, but because you're a public employee, you know, your privacy is, is less than in the private sector. Um, so those things, you know, would, would generally be released if they pertain to your employment. But, but other issues that maybe are in a personnel file, but they're more about, you know, your life outside of work, um, those could be things that you wouldn't necessarily have to release. Uh, we mentioned attorney-client privilege earlier. The key thing with that is, again, you know, legal advice that you're getting, you know, from your town attorney, you're not sharing it with everybody. Um, you know, those are records that you wouldn't have to, you wouldn't have to release. There's also a time limited exemption when it comes to bids. Um, it, this is not, a, a, well, it's one of the newer exemptions. It's been in the law now for about 15 years. Um, but there is a provision that says that until you award a contract, a board can review bids in executive session and, and those, those records are exempt from disclosure. So, um, you know, if, if your board goes out to bid for something, um, and somebody wants the bids, you know, wants the bids back, but you're still in negotiations with the contractors. You could say we're not going to give the bids out until we award the contract. Once the contract is awarded, you would need to give all the bids out. You would need to discuss the project in public um, at, at, at that point. Um, and then the last one that I'll mention that comes up from time to time is what we call trade secrets. And this is essentially, you know, as, as a government agency, you know, sometimes town halls take in a lot of information from vendors or businesses. You know, proprietary information that they don't share otherwise. Um, so this trade secrets exemption basically says, you know, look, if they're sharing it with the town for a particular purpose um, and they don't share it publicly, then the town doesn't have to share that information in response to an FOI request. Sometimes this could be, you know, pricing information. It could be, you know, sort of patterns or schematics or things that make their product, you know, better than their competitors. The type of information they share with you because you're a customer, but they're not going to share. Um, on their website or, 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 or post publicly. So those are just a few of the common exemptions. Um, I want to leave a little time for questions at the end. I want to be mindful um, of, of everyone's time. But the last thing, um, you know, again, if you take one thing away from tonight, um, I would just want you to know that we are here as a resource. You know, we are not just the bad guys that you have to come to and have a hearing when something goes wrong. 
I would like to think we do these training sessions to try to avoid complaints because we, you know, as I said, we get 600 or 700, we don't need any more. Um, if you ever have questions about anything, um, just please give, give the office a call. Um, my number is 860-566-5600. Um, and my email is just my name, so Russell, R-U-S-S-E-L-L -S -S -E dot Blair, B-L-A-I-R, at ct.gov. Um, if you have a concern, I would rather have us have a conversation ahead of time, um, talk about it, I'll give you my opinion, I can try to find some cases, maybe that's one good thing about FOIs, because it's been the law for 50 years, there's a lot of precedent. Um, you know, some of the questions you all asked tonight, I'm sure if I went onto our website, I'd probably find cases, you know, um, on those very points. Um, we may disagree, you know, you may think this is appropriate for executive session, I may not, but at least we can have a conversation about it ahead of time. Um, I can try to give you my best guidance, um, and, and then you're prepared, and you know, you're, you know when you're making a decision about this. Because the challenge with all this, I forgot to mention this in the beginning, is that, um, you know, I'm not an attorney, and I, and I imagine most of you aren't either, but FOI can be tricky because all of a sudden, you know, you're having to interpret a law, right, that you maybe are very unfamiliar with. So. Um, if you're nervous about it, that's okay. You can call us, you can email us, um, and, and we can try to help you um, to answer those questions. Because as we said, you know, we don't want FOI to get in the way of the important work that you're doing. You know, it's important to do the work in public. Um, you know, even if you're on you know, a small border commission, you know, you're still doing important work for the town. So we want people to do the work in public. We want the public to be informed about what's going on in their town and be able to see the boards making their decisions. Um, and we want FOI to be something that you know what you need to do in regards to FOI. Um, it's not this big burdensome thing that you're worried about. Um, you can do what you need to do effectively. You can still have your meetings. You can still get your work done. Um, but if anyone has any questions about anything we covered, meetings, records, any, anything like that, I'd be happy to take them. Yes? Can you repeat your number again? <laughs> sure. 860-566-5600. And if you call me, I promise I will call you back. I think your clerk can attest I'm usually pretty quick about, about responding. If I don't know the answer, I, I will try to find someone who does. Yeah. Real briefly, could you just read the definition of a public record again? Sure. Um, so, public records, any recorded de data or information relating to the conduct of the public's business, prepared, owned, used, received, or retained by a public agency, or to which a public agency is entitled to receive a copy by law or contract, whether such data or information be handwritten, typed, tape recorded, videotaped, printed, photostatic, photographed, or recorded by any other method. So, so my question is, what public record does an agency have by right that you know, goes into that agency? For instance, you have two commissioners, they're not a quorum, uh, get caucus, but they, they're not a quorum, sure. they talk about something and, you know, wanting to do good for the town. What's the difference between that and an email? In other words, that's a recorded conversation of that conversation. Is that email become a public record because the agency has a right to that conversation? Or... So the email between the members would be a public record, but um, so, are, so are you the, asking about, like, if you have an in-person conversation, there's no record of that type of thing? or? Well, yeah, well, that's the point. So in other words, if it's recorded in an email, that conversation, yeah, if, it's yeah, a public exactly, record, exactly. it's discoverable, but they could not, somebody couldn't make a FOIA request and make a fishing expedition and say, did you have a conversation? Like, no, conversation. yeah, so that's... Did you have a conversation with somebody about this? Issue? Sure, so... Um, and, and that's not foia that's no, discoverable. Um, yeah, and, and also, um, I mentioned this sometimes too, under FOIA... I saw um, from that section of Yeah, there's no... Um, there's no requirement to answer questions under FOIA, so if somebody sends you a list of questions, why did your board do this? You know, who decided this? You know, why did you think this was a good idea? You know, you're on a border commission, you may want to respond to some of those questions, you may want to provide some insight into how you arrived at the decision, but that's not an FOI request. An FOI request needs to be, you know, I want the emails between you and this person, not when did you talk to the person, who were you talking to, you know, who did you talk to before you decided on this? Um, you know, you don't have to respond to those questions the way you would an FOI request. You just need to provide records that you have under FOI. Sorry, before I take my question, I think you have a question? Yeah, does that mean we're not allowed to delete any emails? So, um, FOI doesn't deal with record retention. There are record retention laws, um, but it's the Connecticut State Library, the Office of the Public Records Administrator. 
My understanding with emails is there's different schedules based on what the content is, but for most sort of business emails, I think it's like two years you're supposed to retain them. Um, we don't do, you know, with, under us, if you don't have the email anymore, you know, we don't do anything. You know, if you don't have it, you don't have it. Um, so under FOI, you can only produce records that you, that you still have. But there are records retention laws, so I would, you know, again, you can check that, Connecticut State Library. Um, there is a period of time you're supposed to retain emails if they pertain to, to board business. To that end, actually, my question was, is it, some, is it worth consideration from those who are on boards and commissions to have an email that's specific to that, to that board or commission? Um, so is, that, is that a recommended type Do you mean in terms of like a town email or them creating their own? No, they're creating their own. Just something that's not sure. personal email. So um, that is a suggestion I've made in the past for a couple reasons. One, it, then all your town stuff is in one place and it's easier to find if you get a records request. The other thing is, um, you know, sometimes people don't want their email that they use for everything necessarily to be out publicly. So if you use a different email, um, that, that's the thing is that, you know, if somebody FOIs your emails, your email address is going to be on there. You know, it's, your email address is not going to be redacted on every email that you send. If you're emailing about town business, people have a right to the email, and that includes you know who sent it. So if you created a new email account, you know you could it, it would solve a couple of, of those situations, including you know if you don't want everyone to have your Gmail, if you make you know John Smith Planning and Zoning at gmail.com, then that can be your you know your board business account. So it's not a bad idea, um, but you could use whatever email you want. You just have to know that. If you use your email that you use for everything else, make sure that you're retaining the records relating to your board, or you know maybe put them in a certain folder or something, so you can make sure that you, that you have those in one place. Yes. I'm assuming this applies to text as well. Yeah, text messages as well. Um, you know, again, only things related to the board, you know, board business. So if you're, you know, if your fellow board member and you are talking about recipes or things like that, you know, those are not. Things that would be FOIable, but if you're talking about you know decisions or board meetings or things like that, those would be what somebody could request. Any other questions? Yes. Um, so can anyone just ask for an FOI, or does it have to come through with, as a complaint? Um, no, anyone. So uh, the way it would happen is you would just get a, a request first. The complaint comes when typically the requests are not are not fulfilled. Um, anybody. Can file an FOI. Um, you know they don't need to give you a reason or, or anything like that. Um, so if you get, you know, somebody if you're on a border commission, somebody could email you and they could ask you for, you know, a anything that's within your within your purview. That's an important thing to know too. Is that FOI? It's only the records that you have. So if somebody, you know, if you're on planning and zoning, somebody emails you and they want records that are at the first selectman's office, you could tell them, hey, you've got to contact the first selectman. You're not obligated to. Um, you know, pass on requests to other agencies. You know, if you're on the board of ed and somebody wants, you know, town hall records, you can tell them you got to go to town hall. It's only things that you have that you have access to. Yes. So how is the validity of that even enforced? Because if I'm, in, if someone does a FOIA request on me or on my board, I can essentially censor what I hand over. Well, if you redacted things, they could file a complaint with us um, if they believe that the redactions were improper. Um, so, you know, when we talk about exemptions, we didn't get into too much detail of that, but those are the things where, you know, you have the ability to redact certain information. You know, if it's a personnel matter, if it's a privacy concern, attorney-client privilege, trade secrets, um, you know, um, legal advice from your town attorney, you know, so. so you know, you have the ability to redact certain information, but you know, if somebody believed that you, you know, let's say they wanted your emails between you and a fellow board member, and you just said, "I'm not going to give them to you," then that's when they would file a complaint with us. Or if you gave them emails and there were redactions in there, and they said, "What, what did you redact?" and you said, "None of your business," you know, they could file a complaint with us. Um, and potentially, what could happen is when we're dealing with records cases, sometimes the commission we will do an independent review of the records, so we would look through them look at what you redacted and we would determine if the redactions were, were proper. But there can be information that you can certainly redact um, in response to a request, but it would need to, you know, fit into one of those different exemptions that we talked about. Generally speaking, from a Wood Bridge Boarding Commission standpoint, if you get a request like that, you call us and you let us know and we'll we'll work it through. We'll help work it through. So I mean, don't feel like you need to you know you need if somebody calls and says I want you know I want emails that you exchanged last week with regard to whatever, call. Because we have the, that's what our attorney is here for, to help and understand, make sure we do the right thing and, and provide the right information. 
or not. How many requests have you had like this? Like how many you typically get like in a year? For Woodbridge. I, 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 well, we get a lot. I think Stephanie gets a lot. Usually of they office. come through our office, through the town well, clerk's yeah. office. Um, and most of the time, they don't go to the, they, they're not for the boards and commissions, um, you know, for your emails. <coughs> I haven't seen that so far. Um, you know, we'll get requests for things that we have in our office mostly or in the other departments. But the boards and commissions, they don't usually, I haven't seen any of them. I can tell you I've been on boards and commissions for the better part of 15 out of the last 18 years, you know, 15 to 18 years, 20. We've never had to give anything. Yeah. So, you know, from, from the board and commission standpoint, and I've never been even on a board where they said, we need to give something, and it just didn't, it didn't concern me. So yeah, my, my, my view of it is typically boards and commissions don't have a lot to do with FOI requests, which is why we spend more time with meetings. But I, the m most important thing is to be aware is that you could get one. Right. Because right. if you get one, what you don't want to do is say, well, I'm not, I'm not responsible, and then, you know, don't respond to it, and then all of a sudden, complaint comes in the town hall and they're like, wait, what happened? You know, you never told anyone. So to his point, if you get one, tell, where, you know, every town does it a little bit differently, but get in contact with somebody and make sure that you guys, you know, handle it appropriately. If there's certain records you don't have to give out, you don't want to give those out. Um, so, so if you're on the receiving end, you know, you want to make sure that you contact somebody so you, you, you know, it gets handled appropriately. Because you don't want to just not do it and say, well, I don't care. Because then, you know, you get a letter that there's a big complaint been filed and you have to come to a from my perspective, the bigger, one of the bigger issues from a board and commission standpoint is that you do something that's, that ends up, you make a recommendation to the board of selectmen, and we take an action based on the recommendation only to find out that it was done in the wrong way, and, not, and, as, and as Russell said, now you have to go back and you have to figure out or undo what you've done before. And it's just, I know last year the board of edit Amity had a big one that took a lot of time, but it's, you know, from our, your perspective, it's more about just doing the right thing so that somebody doesn't undo something that we're, we're trying to get done. Yeah, and, and the other thing that um, Tom Hennick, who used to do this uh, for me, would always make a point to say, you know, the other thing with board members to keep in mind is, you know, your emails among your board are public records. So um, not to say you can't use email to communicate, but just be mindful that if you're talking about public projects and board decisions and things like that, somebody could FOI those emails. So you, you, you know, you want to be mindful of what you're sending because you don't want something that would be embarrassing or, or you know, you wouldn't want somebody to, to see, you know, because someone could ask for it, you know, and just because it's, you were having a bad day and you said something you regretted, you know, it doesn't, that's not an exemption, um, you know, under FOI. So if you're putting it down to your point, you know, written versus oral, if you're writing it down in an email, just, you know, be mindful of, of what you're saying um, and potentially who could you know, have access to it. Again, not to scare you off, but, you know, like if you're dealing with, you know, planning and zoning and site plans and things like that, you want to be careful about what you're saying in emails to board members because the developer gets angry that the project gets rejected and he wants to see everything that was written about it. You know, that could include emails among the board members, so. Generally, if you communicate as if everybody was watching, you're fine. Yeah, and, and the other thing, too, is a lot of the board work is, I mean, it's, you know, it's not, it's not the most interesting thing in the world, so, so a lot of times, you know, you may not have things to necessarily be worried about, but especially when you're dealing with the controversial ones. Um, you know, you want to be, those situations in particular, um, you want to be mindful. Um, you know, even, if, you know, the same thing with the public meetings. Even if nobody ever comes to your meetings, um, they're still public meetings. So, you, you know, you don't want to say, well, who would care? Cause no one's, you know, that could be the one day somebody wants to come. It's the one time you say, well, you know, whatever, we're not going to do the agenda. Who cares? You know, I think it, I think it most as well. Um, so you, you, you know, do yeah, do do it as if people were watching. So. Um, but with that, again, thank you all for the good questions. Um, you've got my contact information. There's some handouts up there if you want to, if you can grab one. Um, but um, again, really, thank you again for the thank time. you. Thank you. Thank you.